out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing so open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise your presence in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now lord unveil our eyes you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing so open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Lord show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us Show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days oh yes i will count on one thing the same god that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out he's working all things out oh yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for 
joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will, and I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Then nothing can stand again. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. Oh, church that we we have a God we serve a Lord who is so good so big who's done so much for us that when we have a horrible week some of you have had a horrible week some of you are anxious about the season that we're in when we have all of the mess of this life that we're dealing with we can still show up and recognize that he is bigger and better and more awesome than all of it. And he turns all of it around for us so that we can praise even in the low moments. I'm, I'm reminded by this song of a scripture that says that, that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him. And I'm also reminded of that passage that says that uh, these light momentary afflictions are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. We have a God that takes all of it and turns it around in the end for his glory and our good. Amen? Give him some more praise this morning, church. Go ahead and have a seat. It's really good to be here today with you. I'm excited to worship the, the same Lord with my friends, my family, and the church this morning. If you're new here, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's really good to see you. We're excited that you've chosen to worship with us. If you are new here, let us know who you are. Uh, there is a QR code up there. It's on the bulletin that you got when you came in. Um, if you scan that with the camera app on your phone, you can click the link and tell us a little bit about yourself. That will shoot me an email, and I'll reach out to you this week and ask how we can pray for you, how we can connect. If there are questions you have about the church, we'd like to get to know you so you're not just a stranger popping in and out, but you can connect with this community of faith. Um, a couple of things we want you to know about. First, today, what's happening in our parking lot? Trunk, trunk or treat. That's right. So invite your neighbors out to trunk or treat. It's a lot of fun. It's so much candy. Um, so come and bring people you know. If you are bringing a trunk, if you're here to help with a trunk, uh, please be here. Um, Elizabeth says, ready at 345. So I think be here at about 315. That sounds good to me. Be here at 315, park, get your trunk all decorated uh, so that you're ready at 345. Some of you are like, I'm staying all afternoon because we got work to do. Praise God. Um, next Sunday, I have a couple of things to let you know about. First, we have a new members class that is starting next Sunday, and that's going to be at 11 a.m., and it's in the conference room right on the other side of that wall. So if you're new here, if you've been visiting, if you have questions about the church, would like to find out how you can get more connected, what this church values, what we believe in, uh, please come out to that class. You do not have to become a member just to take the class, but you do have to take the class to become a member. So come on out, get your questions answered at the end of the class. It's four Sundays. You can decide, is this the church for me? Or, or maybe I need to think about it and pray about it some more. The other thing is next Sunday, we're, we're calling it our New Beginnings Sunday because we're going to give you a huge update on some of our hopes and dreams for that New Beginnings house. 
Uh, we have Jeannie Porterfield is going to come up here and, and chat with me, as well as a, a new guy to you all. His name is John. He is, um, he's the guy that sort of served as like the general contractor for the project at the Gaithersburg Maternity Home for Gabriel Network. So he's done this kind of thing before. He's going to come and share some of his passion and some of his ideas for the future. Uh, it's going to be a great time to see what we're, what we're shooting for, what we're aiming for. And last thing, last but not least, I want to give you a quick report on our Give Kids the World trip. Do we have the pictures there? One of these, no, stop. One of these, that was me being lazy. One of these is really exciting. We'll see when you find it. Uh, that, the, so I kept hearing stories about Give Kids the World, but it was awesome to see it with my own eyes. It's, it's a, um, it really is like a mini Disney World. It's a mini amusement park. They've got villas. There's places where uh, these families stay. If you don't know who we're talking about, this is an organization that, that takes in families that are going through uh, medical crises with their kids. Serious, typically life-threatening medical issues. There was one uh, mom who just very openly in front of the whole family kept telling us, my daughter's terminal, my daughter's terminal. And we all felt like, holy cow, that is a heavy thing to say. But this, this place gives families like that a chance to have a break from all of the medical drama, a break from the stress of life. And so um, there's, it's just, it's awesome. There is um, uh, uh, like a, a mini water park, they have uh, an ice cream shop. And so when we go down there, here's what we do. We just say, where do you want me? So the first night I was out there, I was working the ice cream shop. I've never made uh, milkshakes in my life, but I made five milkshakes that night. And there's a little, yeah, look at that. Who is that? Isn't that cool? Hey, ladies in the church, you've had a crush on John Stamos your entire life, haven't you? So. Next year, we're going to go again in October, and you never know who you get to run into. Husbands, your wives are going to run into John Stamos. You should sign up and volunteer and come too, okay? Yes. See how we did that? Praise God. All right. Um, it's a blast, and, and here's, here's what we're doing. We are loving and serving people who desperately need some love and some service, and we're doing it while wearing a church shirt. Some of these people were surprised that a church cared. Uh, some of these people used to go to church and they'd walked away and we got to give them a, a good taste of Jesus for a moment. And some of these families opened up with us and we've got their cell phone numbers and we're still communicating and we've prayed with them and we've, uh, we've shared hope in the gospel with them. And I was surprised that the people I got to communicate the most with were the other non-Green Ridge volunteers who got stationed with me for a five-hour shift, watch out. I'm like, so where are you from? What made you volunteer? Oh, yeah? And they're like, what made you volunteer? And I'm like, I'm here with my church. You a church person? You go to church? Tell me about that. You ever hear of Jesus? It was great. Five hours locked with a pastor. So there's missions opportunities. Um, one of, the, one of the ladies who works with the volunteers there, she, uh, she gave us a card, and I won't read the whole thing, but she wrote, um, my passion for the village and for volunteering is why I started working here. I can say with confidence that, the, that seeing the great service you all have given through the past three years, I have been at the village, is uplifting and admirable. And she talks about how it's groups like ours that actually help her want to keep doing this instead of give up. So we praise God for that. Um, the OC video? Yeah. All right, we have uh, something that we help with every year. It's called Operation Christmas Child. It's one more way that we love to serve people in the world. So we've got a video for that. And then Cindy, I think, is coming up to share her heart. When children open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. 
because we bring gift to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Cindy Armstrong, and um, I am lucky enough to be the drop-off leader here at Green Ridge for Operation Christmas Child Week, which is November 18th through the 25th this year. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for um, participating in this ministry. Um, it's been over 12 years now that we've done it here at, at OCC. Actually, my Jenny started it with Tirza for the first year. Tirza Turner, so... It's a great thing. Um, last year, in 2023, GBC alone collected uh, over 300 shoeboxes from our church family. That's amazing. And our drop-off location here at GBC, corporately from our, our community, collected 1,168 shoeboxes. Now I have some more numbers for you. In the United States, over 10 million shoeboxes were collected alone. Globally, 11.3 million boxes were collected. What an amazing way to reach the end of the earth with a gospel. Out of that number, 5.1 children attended The Greatest Journey, which is a 12-week um, program, Bible study program that the kids can attend, choose to attend. Out of that number, 2.9 million decisions for Christ were made. So those are just amazing, aren't they? Yay, amen. So I want you to think, when you pack your shoebox, lovingly pack and prayerfully pack it, think of it as a seed. That seed goes out to a, a child. While it goes out to one child, it goes into a family. That family lives in a village. And that, just think of it as it growing and growing, that the word of Christ is keep reaching the family, the villages, and nations. Um, shoe boxes are available now, saying in the lobby. And shout out to Ranger Overby and his boys' brigade that they, if, yeah, efficient, yay, guys. <laughs> they efficiently and lovingly put them together every year for us. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Let's see what else do I have here. Oh, please remember um, when you pack your shoe boxes that no candy, gum, liquids, Basically, anything with an expiration date can go into the box. And certainly no GI Joes or any helicopters or anything war-related. Uh, let's see. Also, uh, it started registration for um, the Processing Center last week. You can sign up. If you've never served at the Processing Center, um, our boxes go from here to Redland Baptist. From Redland Baptist, they go on a truck and go to Baltimore. A warehouse there. That's where all the shoe boxes are opened, and just made sure that everything in it is is okay. There's nothing that shouldn't be in it, and if there's not enough in it, they pack more stuff in it. But it's just a lot of fun and uh, just an amazing um, operation. Eight hundred thousand boxes went through Baltimore last year, and so also. Um, and also, if you, if you don't feel like shopping or you don't have time, just go online and build a shoebox. You can do that, too. And also, during um, volunteer week, I would love to, I'm, collection week, I would love to have some volunteers help me pack boxes. So Pastor Mark doesn't have, I don't know, he helped me pack over 100 boxes last month, <laughs> the last day of uh, collection week last year. Yeah, you did. <laughs> So anyway, thank you again for your help in this ministry, and let's go reach the ends of the earth with our shoe boxes. Church, at this time, one of our elders is going to come and lead us in the Lord's Prayer. After that, we will sing a couple more songs together. Uh, good morning, Greenridge family. I'm James. You don't know me. Um, 
So my wife and I were up early drinking coffee on the couch, and we were talking about uh, how can we get our kids, because I help teach the kids downstairs, or our teens, she helps volunteer with the youth, when we talk about deep, important things, and we're asking questions, how can we prevent the glazed over look and the churchy answer? How can we really focus on the core important thing about what Jesus has done for us? And I think with the Lord's Prayer, doing it every week, saying it together every week, it's a chance for us to uh, take a break from focusing and tend to go in that glazed over look, say the words, and refocus on maybe the challenges of the week or something else going on. So I want to encourage you and challenge you to take this time today and every week not to just say words, but to focus your heart with your brothers and sisters here and around the world to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to get to the deep, important issues that we need him for. So with that, feel free to say this in the native language you're used to or the original Bible version you're used to. So hold out your hands in a posture of worship and prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lost are saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear. No place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your great name, your great name. All the weak find their strength the sound of your great name. Hungry souls receive grace at the sound of your great name. The fatherless, they find their rest at the sound of your the sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. Savior, defend. 
God. Just your voices, church. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your greatness and your goodness to us. You've demonstrated your greatness and goodness to us so often in so many ways. And Father, we've gathered this morning to worship you because of all of those things. Receive our worship today. I pray that our hearts would be in a good place to give you the worship you deserve. Father, we need you. Help us today. Father, I pray for the ladies as they continue to to lead us in worship. I pray that this song would be a blessing to us and it would be glorifying to you. Speak to us by what they sing today. Father, we want to give you the glory and praise you deserve. Help us do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
KBW Kids, you are dismissed. Uh, if you're new with us and you've got kids that are elementary school age, um, this is Kids Praise and Worship. They're going to go downstairs and have their own kind of service time. If uh, you don't know what's going on, you've got kids in that range, go ahead and you can go with them and introduce yourself to one of the children's ministry workers and just see what's happening. Um, adults, we are going to pray for the kids. We're going to pray for uh, any offering that's taken up today, and we're going to pray for Mark. Before I do that, uh, I want to point out that Jack Wilson is here. <laughs> Praise God. And I'm sure he hated that I did that, but that's okay. Uh, we praise God for the recovery that uh, God is continually working in Jack's life, so praise God for that. Let me pray for us. Father, we are thankful for your kindness to us. We see that demonstrated with Jack. We're thankful that he's here and recovering, and we pray that you would continue to do that. God, we pray for our kids today that you would bless them. Um, we pray that, that you would open their hearts and their minds to receive the gospel, help them to understand that Jesus loves them and died for them and that they can have eternal life through him. Help them to understand that today. We pray that our children's ministry workers uh, would receive all of your grace and all of your mercy today. I pray that you would uh, help them to be patient and kind and loving, but also help them to be clear as they communicate the things of your word. Um, we just pray that you would save our children from their sins and start them on a on a path of a deep, meaningful life with you. We also pray, God, that you would bless any offering that's taken up today. We recognize that it's not our money, it's your money, and we want to steward it well. And we pray, Father, that you would take it and use it for the building up of the kingdom of God, use it for the glorification of Christ. Um, and, Father, we pray that you would continue to train our hearts away from greed and toward dependence on you and devotion to you through the discipline of tithing. And finally, Lord, we pray that this message would be good for our souls to hear. I pray that you would use Mark to uh, communicate effectively to us from your word. I pray that uh, we, would, we would hear what we need to hear today. And I pray, Lord, that with this sermon, you would convince us of the truth of the gospel, convict us of our sins, compel us to faith and obedience, and comfort us in our pain. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning again, church. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Philemon. Philemon is a tiny little book. It's probably just one page in your Bibles. It's in the New Testament. It is towards the end. It's after 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, and it's right before Hebrews. It's really hard to find. If you get there, you get, a, you get candy. I'm kidding. Come to Trunk or Treat, you'll get candy. Um, we are wrapping up our series today in Philemon, and over the past two weeks... Look, you're going to feel a little lost if you haven't heard the past two weeks of sermons. I'll try to catch you up, but you should go back and listen, because most of us, we don't know what this little letter is about. We have seen this conversation that happened 2,000 years ago from the Apostle Paul writing to a man named Philemon. And remember, the Apostle Paul and Philemon are both Christian brothers. Philemon, however, is a slave owner. Both are Christians. Paul is talking to Philemon, he's writing to him, because Paul has met a runaway slave named Onesimus, and Onesimus belongs to, legally, Philemon, and Onesimus has run away and encountered the Apostle Paul, who has shared the gospel with him, and now Onesimus is a Christian, and the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to Philemon to ask him to graciously forgive a runaway slave. Paul is viewing, he is viewing his own duties to his fellow man, 
He's viewing Philemon's obligations to Onesimus. He's viewing all of that through the lens of the gospel. Because the gospel says now that this is their brother in Christ. And the gospel changes the way that we operate in this world, doesn't it? Paul is not asking Philemon to view this situation through the lens of the Roman law that they live under. He's asking him to view it through the lens of the gospel. And today, the past few weeks, that's what we've been trying to to understand. What, What can we do today to view our culture's current issues, our current political climate, the debates of our day, what can we do to put the gospel in front of us as a lens by which we view all of these things? Because the gospel of Jesus, listen, if anything impacts what you think is right and wrong and how you think righteousness and justice should be pursued, shouldn't it be the gospel? Amen, right? And so we need to allow the gospel to shape us and guide us on this. And I'm not saying that's easy and we'll have a clear-cut black and white. We'll all agree in kumbaya, but we need to be striving for that. And today what we'll see is that Paul thinks the gospel really, truly requires something of Philemon. It's not up to Philemon's preference here. There is, a, there is an act of obedience Paul is calling him to because of the gospel. And I want, I want you to listen to the whole letter. Now that you've heard us kind of teach through it, I'm just going to read the main body of it, not the intro, not the outro. Listen to this whole letter, verses 8 through 21, and tell me if you can now hear what Paul is asking him to do. Even though Paul doesn't clearly say, free him. Can you hear what Paul is asking? Let's read in verses 8 through 21. Accordingly, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And then he says, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. We know that the Apostle Paul uh, was not released from that prison. That he did remain there, that he was not graciously given back to Philemon. He did not pay him a visit. And I wonder if Philemon actually did have a guest room ready for Paul and they were praying, any day now the Lord's going to release him. Church, like we said last week, Paul is appealing to love and goodness for Philemon to no longer treat Onesimus as a runaway slave, to not do what Roman law says he has the right to do, and instead he is asking him to do what the gospel calls him to. And Paul is pretty careful not to come down harsh with commands and ungracious arguments. We talked about the wisdom of that last week, right? That taking a gracious approach and sharing our heart and calling people to goodness is a winsome way of having conversations where we disagree instead of just trying to hit them with our soundbite, right? That, that promotes argument, but when we are gracious, we can have a real conversation. But make no mistake, that the Apostle Paul makes it clear that there is a right and wrong here. That Philemon is not just free to do whatever he wants. Rather, the gospel puts a whole new set of duties on him, responsibilities on him. Did you hear some of that language? Look again at verse 8. He says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you 
to do what is required. See, Paul doesn't say, Philemon, I'm bold enough to command you to do what I think you should. He doesn't say, Philemon, I'm bold enough to command you to do what I want, my preference. He says, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required of you. Required? By whom? Not Roman law, but probably a heavenly law. Paul is implying heavily here that Jesus and the gospel do require something of Philemon, and therefore Jesus and the gospel require something of us. Amen? This issue of their day is not really up for debate in heaven's eyes. It's not a matter of preference. God requires something of his people on the treatment of slaves like Onesimus. Second, I want you to look at how he ends it in verse 21. He says, I am confident you will obey, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So, didn't Paul just say, I'm not going to command you? I'm not going to command you. And then he says, I'm confident you'll obey me. Huh? As gentle as the apostle has been, as much as he has appealed and tried to win Philemon over to his side, when it's all said and done, Paul is not too ashamed, not too gentle, not too polite to say, there is a right and wrong here and you need to do the right thing. There is a higher standard from God and that Christians are called to do what God requires and go above and beyond what the world would ask of them. The last idea that I, I want to give us today, and we'll, we'll look at some reasons for this, but the last big idea is that Viewing our duty through a gospel lens requires Christians go above and beyond the world. We have to go above and beyond where the world will go. We've talked about making sure that uh, the people who disagree with us don't become in our own hearts just people that we hate and see as enemies. We've talked about that, and that is important. And we've talked about having compelling and gracious conversations to appeal to people in love that's important but today we need to recognize that in our disagreements there are times where on an issue our disagreements are not just a matter of preference we have to recognize there are times where heaven has an opinion and we have to hold to it and we have to work for it and we have to strive after it we have a duty to the gospel and to Jesus to do what is required of us by God. Before we look at how that might play out, because I, <laughs> hold your breath, I am going to talk a bit about what this looks like in our personal lives and how this should shape our political views. And I'm even going to give you some of my thoughts on how I process all this election stuff. But first, I, I want to show you two reasons that Paul gives that the gospel should change what we think we owe, what we think is required of us. Let's look at the first one in verse 15 and 16. He says, For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The Apostle Paul is doing one more thing here to shift Philemon's understanding. He asks Philemon to consider how the gospel has changed the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. I want you to receive him back, not just as a slave, but as your what, church? Your brother. I get what the Roman law says he is to you, but there is a heavenly law that has changed all of that. The gospel says he's your brother because Jesus has bled and died for him just as he's bled and died for you. Jesus has turned you and him into a son of God, adopted into the family. We are all now members of the household of God, citizens of the heavenly kingdom. And so in that light, you are owed, Onesimus is owed something from you, Philemon. The gospel calls us to go above and beyond what the law of the land says we owe, and it calls us to a heavenly obligation, a familial obligation to one another. The gospel requires we go above and beyond worldly legal obligations all the way to heavenly family obligations. 
And this should make clear, obvious sense to us, right? I mean, think about it. Being a good Christian is not just don't commit any crimes, right? Isn't the bar higher than that, right? You're not a good Christian just because you didn't shoplift. You're not a good Christian just because you never committed murder. The law says don't do those things. But Christ compels us to go further than that, to serve other people that we don't otherwise owe anything to. Is there a law that commands that you volunteer at the soup kitchen? No, there's no law for that. But doesn't the law of Christ call you to service? Amen. The law of Christ and the gospel call us to go above and beyond the bare minimum of the laws of this land. Think about it this way. When you are driving, and let's remove all moral ambiguity, okay? You are driving on an open road. There is no residential area. There's no school zone. You look, and the speed limit sign says 35. Friends, tell me what math you're doing. Because I know we're doing math. None of us, okay, 4% of us see that speed limit sign. It says 35, and we say, okay, 34 it is, right? 4% of us do that. The rest of us, we're doing math. And it's just, it's not a question of are you doing math. It's a question of do you add 5? or nine, or 11, are you that bold, right? And, and so when we see a speed limit sign, we are thinking to ourselves, not, oh yes, of course, we are thinking, how far can I push this before the red and blue appears behind me, right? Before I see that in the mirror. That's what worldly laws call us to. Almost all worldly laws make us feel like that. What do we owe? We don't think about that. We say, how far can, how close to that worldly law limit can I get? And some of us even think, how far across it can I go before I actually get smacked, right? That's what we're thinking. That's how we interact with worldly laws. I'm not saying that's a wonderful Christian thing. I'm saying it's a normal human thing, okay? Now, I hope you don't treat your families like that. I hope you have a different sense of obligation to, the, to what you owe your family than what you owe the law. If, so my daughter Michaela is in, well, her season just wrapped up, but she's in baseball all the time. And could you imagine, could you imagine if I sat her down at the beginning of baseball season and I said, hey, Michaela, um, listen, I know you've got, you've got, what, 10 games this season? So like, what's the bare minimum number of games that I need to show up to for you to feel like I was there. Can I get away with two? Can I get two? Three? Okay, we're going three. Can I get a, can I get a two? You know, like, if, if that's how I treat my family, what's the bare minimum effort I need to put in? Can you see how awful a family that would be? Of course I don't do that. My mind is, she's got 10, ten games, I'm going to be at all 10. And it's going to take something huge to move me off of one of those. Okay, with that in mind, Paul is urging Philemon to realize that the gospel calls us to family obligations, not to mere minimum, bare, worldly, legal obligations. The gospel says you better go above and beyond for each other, especially in the church, because these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. When you ask the question, what do I owe this person next to me? It better be a lot. This is our family. And not just in the church, but outside the church, these are all image bearers of God. Even if they're not Christians, they bear the image of the Lord who made us. We owe them a lot. Jesus says, this is our neighbor. Go love them like you would love yourself. We owe so much to each other. That's how the gospel needs to impact our thinking. Not what's the bare minimum I can get away with by the law. How can I go above and beyond for my neighbor, for my brother, my sister because of Christ. Let's look at verses 17, 18, 19, 20. They give us another, another reason to go above and beyond. It says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it. To say nothing of you owing me even your own self, Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. The Apostle Paul is telling Philemon that whatever Onesimus owes you, put that on my tab. 
This is a matter of economics in a very real way for Philemon. You recognize that, right? Um, we, don't, we don't think this way. 2,000 years ago, if you own a slave, you paid money for that slave. That is, a, that is a financial investment. And you are expecting to get every minute of work back from that investment. I'm not saying this is godly. I'm saying this is the real world economics Philemon is thinking about in this moment. And so for Onesimus to run away and end up maybe in Rome with Paul, how far did he have to go? Travel in these days is not quick. Church, I just went a couple weeks ago. I went from Baltimore to Chicago, stayed in Chicago a couple days, went to Florida, went from Florida, layover in, I think, Atlanta, and then back up to Baltimore. If you add up all of my airplane time, I'm thinking it was like six hours, eight hours. Eight hours of travel to do all of that. That's incredible. If you add up all the driving to and from the airport, the layover, we're talking one day of travel to do all of that. In Paul's day, for Onesimus on foot to run away and end up with Paul and then come all the way back to Philemon, we are talking weeks or months. When Paul says if he owes you anything, this is what he's thinking about. All those days of labor that you lost on this investment, this slave, all that slave labor that you lost out on, Philemon, if you're holding that against him, put it on my tab, Paul says. Put it on my tab. Paul makes it sound like, listen, I'm willing to pay it. It actually sounds like he's willing to pay the financial cost. I don't know how much money Paul's got stashed away. I guess he's not spending any of it because he's, he's in prison. So maybe he's got some money somewhere. Or maybe he's thinking of taking up a collection. But beyond that, do you see what he says? He doesn't just say, I'll pay it. He says, and let's not even talk about, Philemon, what you owe me. You owe me your life. Why does he think that? We don't, we don't know. We don't have the background story. Maybe the Apostle Paul jumped in front of an arrow and took it for Philemon. I highly doubt that. Here's the two things I think are way more likely. One day, the Apostle Paul comes upon a man who is sick and dying, and in the name of Jesus heals him. Maybe that was Philemon. Or, maybe, it's the Apostle Paul showing up in, I think, Colossae, meeting these people, Philemon in the crowd, the Apostle Paul stands up and shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, and from that day, Philemon has had eternal life in Jesus because Paul came as a messenger of the gospel. Paul seems to think that Philemon owes him a heavenly debt. Do you see that? And Paul says, that debt outweighs this earthly, worldly, financial cost. Church, the the next thing I want to put on our hearts today is this, that the gospel requires we go above and beyond worldly economics to heavenly economics. Paul is saying, Philemon, stop worrying about the dollars this costs you and start considering what, what matters more in heaven. Does justice weigh more than the dollars you are owed? Yes, it does. Do justice. Honor God. With these ideas in mind, I want to touch somewhat briefly on what this looks like personally and politically. I want to give you some questions to process. As you think about your personal life, how do I go above and beyond because of the gospel in my marriages, my relationship with my family, my coworkers? I want you to think about these questions. The first one is, am I settling for the bare minimum that the world requires regarding a neighbor or Christian sibling God has put in my life? Am I giving to someone just the bare minimum that the world expects of me? Well, I didn't punch him in the face. Great. That's not exactly the most Christ-honoring goal, right? When a coworker asks you to take their shift so they can go out for their birthday, your manager may not require that of you. Totally, I get that. But does neighborly love in the name of Jesus? I mean, if you're free, does it? You better pray about that. 
When your marriage goes through an unhappy year, listen, Maryland is a no-fault divorce state. You can just end it. But does the commitment you made before God require more of you? The second question to be asking is, am I clinging to a legal or cultural right that the gospel calls me to surrender? You've got all sorts of rights in this, in this nation. And praise God for those rights. But sometimes the gospel says, stop talking about your rights. I'll give you an example. Free speech is an easy one. You love free speech in this country, but the gospel calls you to let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except what is useful for building up. And so, yeah, you have the right to speak your mind as you please. You have the right to be rude and blunt. You have the right to use your mouth like daggers to stab people, but not in the eyes of the gospel. The gospel calls you above and beyond that. As we think about going above and beyond worldly economics to heavenly economics, two questions for you. Is the personal cost to me the only reason I've chosen not to do something good? Do we let the personal cost to me drive our decisions? Or do we let what is right and good in the eyes of the Lord? Uh, I know, I know, I could probably benefit from counseling for my family, for my marriage, for my anger, but it just costs too much money and it takes too much time. Is that the, is that the reason? Am I withholding from someone else what God has freely given me in Christ? Church, the reason we are here today is because each and every one of us each and every one of us, we thought we had a better idea on how to live our lives than God. Each and every one of us has turned away from what he said. We have not loved him the way we should. We haven't loved each other the way we should. Each and every one of us has sinned against God and broken his holy commands. Each and every one of us has wrecked our relationship with God and invited on ourselves his judgment and wrath. That's what we've done. Here's what Jesus has done. The Son of God became a man like you and me so that he could meet all the righteous requirements of the law and someday say, Mark met those requirements in me. Londell met those requirements in me. Karen met those requirements in me. And then Jesus went to the cross and he took all the wrath and punishment of God for your sins and mine so that someday before the Lord, God could say, all of Mark's selfishness, it was punished at the cross. All of your greed, it was punished at the cross. And I paid every last cent that was owed. And then, dying and rising for us, Jesus invites us into forgiveness and relationship with God and righteousness and a walk with him. And he gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians says. And so if God has so freely given to us at his great cost, church, is there something God has freely given you in Christ that you are withholding from someone else? Kindness? Forgiveness? Forgiveness is huge. How often do we eat up the forgiveness of God at church over our sins? And then we refuse to forgive family members who burn us. Jesus says, sorry, Ephesians says, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's talk about how these things apply a bit when it comes to the elections and politically. Church, I think that if we are called to go above and beyond the world's legal obligations, and think through heavenly and family obligations, then that means that we need to recognize that just because something is legal, that does not make it just or good or holy or right. Your vote this season is an opportunity for you to call the low bar of the law up to more holiness. It's an opportunity for you to call the low bar of the law up to the justice of God. Just because a law is established does not make it good or holy or right. Amen? And we can vote to help raise the standard of the law. We should do that. We also need to recognize that all people, at the very least, are our neighbors whom we're called to love, and many people are our brothers and sisters in Christ who we owe a great deal to. 
And so your vote is a chance for you to think through ways that you can love your neighbor. How does your vote impact the protections for other people? How does it impact whether people will have better lives or worse? How does it not just affect you, but affect others? And because we're called to go above and beyond worldly economics to heavenly economics, we need to recognize that doing the right, good, just thing may just cost us sometimes. May we not be the kind of people who think about our bank statements first when it comes to voting. May we not be the kind of people that think, how does this affect my taxes or bottom line, number one. That is not the most important thing, and it never will be, church. There are issues that matter far, far more in heaven's eyes, and we need to be willing to think those through well. As your pastor, I want to give you a little insight into how I process this voting stuff. And I'll break it down into uh, presidential candidates, school boards, and, um, and single, single issue votes. The presidential candidate stuff, in my opinion, is the absolute hardest thing for me to figure out what is right. And I'm not about to tell you what I think is right and that you have to do it. The reason that it's so difficult for me is because these votes, presidential votes, they, they are not just a vote on one issue. They're a vote for a person who has a thousand opinions on a thousand issues. And I can't find any candidate who agrees with me on everything. In fact, you're the same, and I think the only way for any of us to find a candidate we agree with 100% is if each of us ran for president and just voted for ourselves, right? So we are stuck with these two options where this guy agrees with me on three things, this guy agrees with me on ten things. Those three th things might be more important than those ten things. Ah, this is difficult, isn't it? It may shock you to learn that Trump and Republicans have ideas that I value and care about. It may shock you to learn that Harris and Democrats have ideas and values that I hold and care about. And so I find it tricky. How do we weigh this? I can say for sure that I am uncomfortable voting for Harris because of her stance on abortion and other things. I can also say I find that I am uncomfortable voting for Trump because of his character and a whole lot of issues. All right, so what do I do? I know there are Christians I've talked to who say, well, I'm just, I'm not voting for president, or I'm going to write in Paul Davis, which, how cool would it be if we all did that, and then Paul could say that he got at least 100 votes for president one time? <laughs> okay, okay, but, 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 Okay, as I process that, I feel like that's wasting my vote. And I have a chance to pick one of these two, and so I'm picking maybe the lesser of two evils. And I know I'm not waiting for the perfect candidate, otherwise I'd have to run, everybody. Um, <laughs> so here's how I process it. I, I think through, it comes down to, for me, which are the most important issues we face? because there's too many to line them all up in one candidate. So I have to think through, is the border the most important? Is the economy? Is abortion? Do the eyes of heaven have a priority on any of these issues? And I will be honest that for me it is hard to see anything as urgent as the issue of abortion. But I understand that the Holy Spirit and your conscience may be coming to a different conclusion. I, I'm not here to tell you what's the most important. And so... What I need to do, and I, what I think I would encourage you to do, is consider which candidate and party is most likely to do something good on those issues you find to be the most compelling. I think that's what we need to do prayerfully and humbly. And we need to make sure that we are not just voting our preference on these issues. We need to ask, what does the gospel require of us on these issues? For example, on the border issue, I think the gospel would call us both to protect the innocent. Listen. The immigrants coming across the border are not all bad people, but we would be fools to say that none of them are a part of cartels, none of them are traffickers, none of them are terrorists. That, that's happening too. And so what we need to do is say, okay, the gospel would care about protecting the innocent from, from bad guys, but we also need to recognize the gospel calls us to care for the foreigner and the immigrant in our midst. The sojourner is at the very heart of God's love. Amen? We see that all throughout Scripture. And the solution is not to say, well, then let's have no foreigner in our midst so that we, you know, done. I cared for all of them. Zero. That's not the solution. And so we have to weigh both of these things. 
I think we have to do that with all of these issues. What does the gospel call us to? What does it require of us? So what issues are at stake? What does the gospel require? Which candidate or party do you think will push the needle the most in the right direction? Humbly, prayerfully make that decision and vote. And please do not cast a vote for someone that is just going to improve your life the most. That's not the most important thing to weigh. It certainly is not in heaven's eyes. And know that whoever ends up in the White House, who's still on the throne of heaven, church? Jesus. Is your citizenship in his kingdom in question? No. That's where our hope lies, not in politics. The other two, quickly, I want to say, uh, school boards, I think we have a unique opportunity in local elections because uh, they are much easier to make a real impact on, I think. I've spoken to dozens of teachers who say that they are unable to keep order in their classrooms, that the administrations don't help them enforce rules. And as our culture around us becomes more sexually confused, there are more and more attempts to get the world's opinions on sexuality and gender and all of it to our children at a younger and younger age. And so we have a chance to vote for school board folks who will impact these issues. So please diligently do your homework and prayerfully choose folks that will protect and shape our next generation in a good, holy direction. And last, we sometimes have the opportunity to vote for single issues. We have an opportunity like that this upcoming election with, I think it's question one. Single issues are the easiest for me because I don't have to weigh a million things. It's just yes or no, is this good or bad? Is this right or wrong? And so I, I actually love the opportunity to vote on such things. Question one is asking to amend the Maryland state constitution to enshrine abortion under a right to rep reproductive freedom. And so my understanding, and listen, I'm not a political, you should do your own research, okay? Always do your own research. My understanding is that a vote yes would make abortion a right in Maryland so that no future laws could infringe on it. And my understanding is that a vote no, it will not outlaw abortion, but it would mean that abortion is not a right under the Maryland Constitution, and that leaves room for laws in the future to restrict abortion. Church, this issue seems black and white to me. Please pray. I, I'm okay with having difference of opinion, but I'm, I'm going to share because I think it is so black and white. All human life is made in the image of God. The Psalms declare that God is the one who knits us together in the womb. And so I believe that we owe it to the gospel and to our Lord to defend the innocent and defenseless human lives that are in the womb. And to be honest, I would guess that this amendment, I'll be voting no. I, I will guess that this amendment will pass. But we have a chance to at least honor God with our vote and leave the results to the sovereign Lord. So I would urge you to do that. I don't know the best way to handle the border. I don't know how much the rich should be taxed. I don't know when it is necessary for the U.S. to get involved in war and when it's time to wait. These are matters of wisdom and nuance, and every choice has so many ramifications. And I praise God that these are not my decisions. But there are some things that I do know what the Lord has said on, and on those I delight that I have an opportunity in this nation to cast a vote for the things that I think he cares about, the things that I think I've figured out. And may God have mercy on us, because we are fallible people making huge choices. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we beg you to have your way in our nation. Lord, our nation, the U.S., has so many amazing bits of Christian heritage. We have rights and freedoms because people understand that you are our creator and you have made us in your image. Lord, there are so many wonderful things that you've done in this nation over its history, and there are so many terrible things and many that are happening today. And so, God, in these elections, we pray that you would establish leaders for us for the next season, leaders who will do your will and not their own, leaders who will do righteousness by your standard and not by the whims of their heart or our culture, leaders who will stand up for truth. God, I pray that you would use them. 
And Father, for those leaders that get elected who do not know you and do not care about your ways, we pray that even still the heart of those leaders would be in your hand like a waterway to direct as you please. God, do good even through broken vessels. Father, we pray for us as we uh, approach election time that you would help us to seek you diligently, to follow your leading by your spirit, to not sear our conscience with anything we do. Help us to do what you are leading us to and let us, God, joyfully leave the results up to you, knowing that Jesus will be on the throne yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and our eternity is secure. Come what may, God, help us not to put too much of our stock in earthly kingdoms. But Lord, for the stewardship of this nation that you have handed us, let us do right. Let us follow you. And God, please bless our nation and turn us away. Turn us away from the sin we are chasing and back to holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, stand with me. As you think about interacting with all of these uh, difficult conversations, I want to leave you with the end of Ephesians chapter 4. Hold your hands out in a posture of reception. Receive this today. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Go and live that way this week, church. You're dismissed.